This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. So for the first few minutes of this session, I'm going to focus on defining the problem and focus on the prevalence and causes of low back pain. After my slides, Dr. Clark from neurosurgery is going to talk about the challenges of diagnosing and treating spine-related pain. Following Dr. Clark's talk, Dr. Chin will talk about how precision imaging is shaping the future of diagnosing and treating back and neck pain, and will comment on the role of this radiologist in imaging of the spine and in performance of image-guided treatments. Okay, so let's define the problem. So spine-related pain is very common. It is one of the most common, in fact, it is the second most common reason for physician office visits in the US. There is a 75% lifetime prevalence of back pain in the United States. One third of adults in the US report back pain in the last three months. So this is really a very common and ubiquitous problem. It, is, it bears a tremendous cost to society, both through the direct costs of spine-related care, as well as the indirect costs of lost productivity. In the United States alone, healthcare expenditures for spine-related pain, and particularly low back pain, exceed over $100 billion annually. And back pain, despite all the, the efforts on, on, on treating patients with back pain, back pain remains the single greatest cause of work disability in the, in the United States. So let's talk about what might be potential generators of back pain. And we'll focus on this model of the spine, which is a model of the lower back. Within the spine, the vertebral bodies, the, the cartilage, and the ligamentous structures work together to protect the spinal cord, support the weight of the upper body, and facilitate movement. Each component of this complex system is dependent upon the other. Between the vertebral bodies are the intervertebral discs. The discs lie between the adjacent vertebral bodies, and each of these discs forms a fibrocartilaginous joint. In other words, it, is, it forms a, a joint with the vertebral body above and below and acts as a critical shock absorber. Additionally, there are also paired joints that line the back of the spinal column, which we call the facet joints. The facet joints connect spinal vertebral bodies at different levels, at adjacent levels. And like most other joints in the body, like the knee, for example, the facet joints are lined with cartilage. These regions of cartilage provide shock absorbance and cushioning within the joints while preventing the bones from grinding against one another. As we age, our spine begins to naturally degenerate over time and due to the overall wear and tear incurred through, 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 the, through the years, through aging. The spinal nerve exits the spinal column behind kind of at the back edge of the vertebral body in front of the facet joint. And so uh, you can see that the disc is in front of it and the facet joint is behind it. And so arthritis of the facet joint or a disc herniation, which is displacement of disc material beyond the confines of the vertebral body, can narrow both the spinal canal and also the space where the nerve is coming out from, what we refer to as the neural foramen. And that can result in symptoms. So what do patients feel? Well, patients may have low back pain, may have a just low back pain or a combination of back and what we call radicular pain, which I'll get to in a second, or just radicular pain or pain that goes into the hands or legs um, along the course of a nerve. So in young patients, low back pain 
is frequently from disc disease. In older patients, low back pain may be from disc disease, but is also commonly from arthritis of the facet joints and inflammation of the facet joints. Radicular pain refers to pain that radiates into the arms or legs along the course of a spinal nerve root. And for those of you that may have experienced this pain, you will never forget it. It tends to be very sharp, electric-like shooting pain that travels down either the arms or legs in a narrow band. And it's often from pinching of a nerve. In young patients, often from a disc herniation. In older patients, it could be from a disc herniation or from spinal stenosis, what we refer to as narrowing of the spinal canal when uh, several of the structures that I showed you on the previous slide can become arthritic uh, or there's bony proliferation around those structures and that leads to narrowing of the space where the nerves in the spinal canal traverse. Imaging plays a critical role in diagnosing these findings and in assessing patients with back or neck pain. It's being used increasingly frequently and given the advances in in imaging in uh, recent decades, we are really able to depict the spinal anatomy and pathology exquisitely. And it's not, imaging now doesn't just refer to CT or MRI, but we have a whole host of hybrid imaging modalities, a combination of imaging modalities, such as a, a fused PET and an MRI, or a SPEC scan, which is a, uh, a type of a, a bone scan and a CT scan. These are, this is a picture from a PET, combined PET MRI. Here is just the PET image. Here is the MRI image. And here is the fused PET MRI image. So these imaging or advanced modalities are uh, proving to be helpful in identifying the source of pain. There's a lot of research in these areas in using these advanced imaging modalities to uh, select patients for particular treatments. And the goal is that eventually these advanced modalities can help improve patient outcomes by directing and targeting appropriate treatments to the specific pain generator. These imaging studies, which includes both your CT, your x-rays, and your MRIs at UCSF are read by extremely well-trained physicians. Most spine radiologists, uh, after four years of college, have spent four years in medical school, five years doing radiology residency, and anywhere from one to three years of a fellowship. These experts play a central role in coordinating care for the patient. And by their reads and by the interventions that they perform, have the ability to substantially impact and change the course of treatment. We work very closely with our referring clinicians. Uh, we have very good relationships with our neurosurgery colleagues. In addition to interpreting the MRIs and CT scans and PET scans, radiologists are also trained in performing image-guided therapy. In our section, in our neuroradiology section at UCSF, there are several faculty members that are expert in providing image-guided treatments. Image-guided spine injections can provide significant benefits in relation to pain relief, disability, and quality of life in these patients. They can help identify the specific pain generator and in some cases help avoid surgery. These injections have a low risk profile when compared with alternative treatments and are effective when used as part of a multimodal treatment plan that might include physical therapy, exercise, and activity modifications. Image guidance is recommended for these treatments so that the, image, the injections can be performed in a safe um, and precise manner. And the image modalities might be ultrasound, CT, X-ray, or MRI. So we've spent the last few minutes um, talking of defining spine pain generators and talking about the prevalence of spine-related pain. I am now going to pass the microphone along to Dr. Aaron Clark, one of the neurosurgeons here at UCSF, who is a specialist in minimally invasive focused spine surgery, who is going to further define the clinical problem, talk about the challenges of diagnosing and treating spine-related pain. Aaron?
thank you, Vanille. And also thank you to Dr. Dillon for including me in this great uh, group um, to talk about something that I'm very passionate about, which is focused in modern diagnostic mo modalities that I can use to help design a, a highly focused and highly successful surgical, surgical plan. I am a consultant for Nuvasiv. Now, current state of diagnosis and treatment, the goals of surgery, to provide durable pain relief, to be as focused or targeted as possible, and also when possible to use minimally invasive techniques. Common causes, similar to what Dr. Shaw discussed, degenerative disc disease, arthritis, spinal instability, and also spinal deformity or scoliosis. This is an MRI scan that uh, demonstrates some of the structures that Dr. Shaw showed us. This is a sagittal MRI scan, so looking at a patient from the side, these are the discs. The bright coloration means that they're well hydrated because they're supposed to be the cushions between the bones of the spine. What immediately jumps out from this second image is at the very bottom. This disc has lost some of that bright coloration, so it's become dehydrated. This is a degenerative disc disease, and this can actually be very painful. All of the images I show here are patients that I've treated. This also applies to the cervical spine of the neck. Similar, sagittal MRI, so it's looking at a patient from the side. All the discs are nice and bright, well hydrated. And here, in the disease state, at this single level, there's a degenerated disc that's actually bulging backwards towards the spinal cord and putting pressure on the spinal cord. Facet arthritis coming from the facet joint of the spine. In this normal image, you can see this is an axial image, so looking from the bottom up at a patient, and you can see nice round spinal canal for the nerves. The nerves are the dots here. And this is the facet joint looking down on it, and the joint space looks very normal here compared to the abnormal state. And what immediately jumps out is there's actually quite a bit of brightness within that joint. That's fluid within the joint indicative of arthritis. And in this case, it's actually progressed to the point where the patient has a little cyst coming from that, from that joint. All of these can be actually very, very painful for a patient. Thinking about the stability of the spine, we actually get specific x-rays called dynamic x-rays where you have a patient lean forward and lean back. In other words, flex and extend through the lower back. And we look for maintenance of this alignment through those normal, normal positions that a patient might, might be in. In the abnormal state, what immediately jumps out is an area, this is called a step off, where there's actually an area of instability. When the patient extends their back, that actually reduces to a more or less normal alignment. So this is an unstable spine. This is, can also be very, very painful. And finally, spinal deformity or scoliosis. In the normal state, it's very, very important to get full-length spinal x-rays to look at the global spinal balance that a patient has and to look at the overall alignment of the patient's spine. So looking at a patient straight on, this patient um, has a very, very straight spine when you look at them front to back. And then looking at a patient from the side, you can see nice balanced curves. So lordosis through the lower back, kyphosis through the mid back, and a reciprocal lordosis through the cervical spine, keeping the head very, very well centered over the patient's pelvis and, and tailbone. In the abnormal state, this patient has scoliosis, so an abnormal curvature of the spine. And looking at this patient from the side, they've actually lost this normal curvature of their back. This is what's called flat back deformity. In other words, that patient's back is very, very flat, and their head is, is now centered too far in front of them. That can also be very, very painful. When thinking of initial management, uh, we never jump directly to surgical management for these problems. Often the first treatments for back pain begins with the primary care doctor. Treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, these are things like ibuprofen, celecoxib, naproxen, core and back strengthening with physical therapy, similar to what Dr. Shaw mentioned, and also spinal injections, which, which I'm gonna touch on later, and Dr. Chin's gonna speak about in much more depth. Patients should be referred to a spinal specialist like myself 
often they fail these non-operative management and they still remain in debilitating pain. If they have a neurologic deficit, if they have foot, um, leg, or arm weakness, that would be an appropriate time to go directly to a spine surgeon. And if they have certain red flags, history of cancer, if they have a spinal infection or potentially some trauma and that could have resulted in a spinal fracture, those are times that you can re refer directly to a spine surgeon. Before delving into the real challenges of diagnosis and treatment of, uh, of spine-related problems, I do want to show a few examples of what I would consider simple diagnoses and simple treatment algorithms. This is going to be very case-based, so it's going to be very clinically relevant. Um, these are all patients that I've treated. This is The first one is a 33-year-old female. She's an environmental scientist and came into the emergency room because she noticed that her left foot was weak. Her foot was dragging and actually would catch on curbs and stairs and this was her MRI scan. What jumps out compared to the normal MRIs that I just showed, is a very, very large herniated disc here. So bulging of this disc backwards and pressing on the nerves. And it is located on the left side, so it's pushing on, on a nerve that could result in foot weakness. And that, that was her diagnosis, what's called a lumbar level four or five herniated disc on the left. So I, I found this to be a relatively simple diagnosis. She has a neurologic deficit that correlates with a single level pathology demonstrated on MRI imaging. And due to her neurologic deficit, this patient needed surgery. And so I treated this minimally invasively. This is through a 16 millimeter incision. I um, use a microscope, which we're all looking down right now. And what you can see here, this is the nerve. I've removed some bone here and this is a special drill to, I'm using to remove a little bit of additional bone to visualize that nerve. I do have some special instruments that I can use to safely remove additional soft tissue to get better visual, visual, visualization of the nerve root here. And eventually underneath this is going to be the disc herniation. This is vi so the nerve is being retracted and protected, and I'm doing an incision in the capsule that's covering that disc herniation. I use a blunt dissector to free up the disc herniation, which you can now see it's pressurized, so it's under pressure. It almost wants to, to jump out at us. And here it comes. This is actually a very large, large disc herniation. And afterwards, the nerve looks nice and healthy. This is the very end of the operation, so the nerve is completely visualized. I can feel under it. It's completely free of pressure. Again, I did this minimally invasively, so as I remove the retractor, you can see all the healthy core musculature that's been preserved. And again, this is a 16 millimeter incision. This is what the patient started with after surgery. This is what it looked like. So the disc herniation is gone. The nerves are completely free of pressure. She went home about an hour after surgery. Her foot strength returned. And within a month, she actually was able to take a planned trip to England where she was walking about 15 miles a day. Second case, a little bit different here. Um, this is a 67-year-old female nurse. She has debilitating back and, and actually pain in both of her legs. She's also had prior spine surgery. And this is what her imaging looks like. So she has scoliosis. She has a flat back spinal deformity. Her head is unfortunately centered well in front of her tailbone, and, and actually that can be very, very painful. And if you look at this MRI, MRI imaging, she has a very diseased spine with degenerative changes at basically every single level of the lower back. So now why would I call this simple? Well, what we know, and this is some modern knowledge that we have about, about spinal deformity and back pain, is that if a patient has a spinal deformity that leaves their head positioned outside of this imaginary cone that just all the extra energy expenditure that the patient has to use to keep upright posture, look straight ahead and walk can be exquisitely painful. And we can actually quantify this with radiographic measurements. We can measure the actual slope of the pelvis. 
the slope of the pelvis actually sets the amount of lordosis that you need within your lower back to keep your head centered over, over your pelvis. And I think that this patient had a clear problem with that. This is demonstrated in this video that, that my department created, and it shows with a relatively low angle of the pelvis, you need not so much lordosis through your lower back. With more medium pelvic, um, pelvic angle, you need more. And with a very steep pelvic angle, you actually need quite a bit of lordosis through your lower back to keep your head centered over your pelvis. When this becomes a problem and a patient's spinal deformity has left them outside of this mismatch of their pelvic angle and their lumbar lordosis, they use all of this extra energy just to keep themselves upright. And eventually they get to a point where they can no longer do this throughout the day and they may use some alternative mechanisms of functioning through daily activities such as using a walker. So for this patient, she had a global problem with her entire spine that needed to be fixed, and that's what I did. I performed a very large operation on this patient. I treated every level of the spine. I corrected her scoliosis, and in the sagittal plane, or looking at her from the side, I was able to place her head back over her pelvis and recreate that normal curvature of her lower back. Now, having said that, there is a gray area in between, and I think this is where the diagnostic challenges lie. A very, very challenging situation is a patient that has multiple levels of degeneration throughout their lower back. They have multiple levels of stenosis or tightness, pressure around their nerve roots. They're neurologically intact, so they don't have a neurologic deficit to help guide therapy, and they have a mild spinal deformity, mild enough that they don't need their entire spine corrected. So how can I design in these settings a focused treatment plan that has a high likelihood of improving the patient's pain? It starts with the basics, the history and the physical examination. How much back pain does a patient have compared to their leg pain? Is the back pain occur only with axially loading the spine, so with standing or lifting? Or is it constant pain? Is it even present when they lay flat? On physical examination, maybe I can detect some subtle weakness that the patient themselves may not even notice. Or if they have a pattern of numbness, does that follow a particular nerve root pattern? And when testing their reflexes, potentially they have a dropped reflex, which, which will help guide exactly what level is causing their problem. Moving on to more advanced diagnostics, we have to remember that our patients don't come like this. So we need to have more advanced methods of looking inside the body to be able to see where the problems are. And this is things that Dr. Shaw has mentioned imaging modalities, x-rays, static and dynamic x-rays, and I hope I've convinced you that full-length x-rays are important for all patients that have back pain to look for a spinal deformity. CT scan is great for looking at bone, and MRI scan is really the gold standard for looking at the disc and the nerves. But sometimes we have to move beyond just standard imaging mod modalities and think for, of more precise ways to specifically diagnose where the, patient, where the patient's pain is coming from. And I want to illustrate the utility of this with a few more cases. So the first case here is a 73-year-old patient. He has Parkinson's disease, and he's also had a prior operation in his spine about four years ago. He has 80% leg pain. It radiates down the front of his legs, and I'll show you in a second that follows what's called an L3 and an L4 nerve distribution. But he does have a 20% component of back pain. It's certainly worse with standing and walking, so when he axially loads his spine, his pain is worse, and it does improve when he's laying down. So there is a mechanical component to it. He's neurologically intact. He's tried everything. He's tried pain medication, physical therapy, and acupuncture. And this is what his spine looks like. So multiple levels of degenerative disc disease, multiple levels of bulging discs. And even in spite of the operation that he had in the past, he still does have levels where there is a little bit of pressure around those nerves. However, he's stable. His spine is stable on flexion and extension x-rays. And when we look at his entire spine, he has very, very minimal scoliosis. And actually doing some complex measurements on his spine that I described to you, he has a very well-balanced spine. So his head is well-centered over his um, hips and tailbone. 
So in this case, how, how can I possibly get more data to help focus a minimally invasive operation and not move towards treating this patient's entire spine when you may not need that? And this is when we start thinking about precision diagnostics. This patient, again, based on this standard diagram of how um, nerves distribute themselves throughout the body, his pain follows an L3 and an L4 distribution in that it radiates down the front of his legs. And there is degenerative disc disease and stenosis at the L3 and L4 levels. In this case, similar to what Dr. Shaw mentioned, I actually referred this patient to our neuroradiology colleagues to try some transforaminal epidural steroid injections at those two levels to determine if those were the pain generators. And that's what we did. This is a CT scan, so highly precise. It's always done here in the CT scanner, and the needles are placed right at the frame and are those bony channels where those nerves are being compressed. Again, it's a mix of a steroid mixed with a local anesthetic. And this patient noticed immediate resolution of his leg pain and significant improvement in his back pain. However, that, that improvement only lasted about two weeks, so very, very transient. Having said that, I consider this a diagnostic success because we had pinpointed the levels, L3 and L4 are the major pain generators. And I was able to design a very focused, minimally invasive fusion at those two levels. And this is what my operating room setup looks like. I actually use image guidance to place these screws. And again, it's down the microscope. Um, I can visualize the nerve root and remove all the bone um, that's putting pressure on this, on this patient's nerves. Instead of getting this operation using these CT-guided transforaminal epidural steroid injections or precision diagnostics, this patient ended up with a much, much smaller operation, just focused at those two levels where he needed surgery. In this case, he was hospitalized less than 48 hours. He went home instead of to rehab. And within six weeks, his pain was controlled just on acetaminophen or Tylenol. In three months, he was back doing Tai Chi, which he liked to do. And these are the incisions. So two 1.5-inch incisions. Second case, a 66-year-old male. He's otherwise healthy. He has 50% left leg pain and 50% back pain, which is also located on his left side. And importantly, he has left foot weakness. First looking at his MRI scan, at the very bottom of the spine, he has two levels where there is pressure around, around those nerves. It is on the left side, so it correlates with his symptoms. But it gets more complex when you look at his x-rays. He actually has scoliosis, very, very severe. Interestingly, this L means that this is his left side. The scolio scoliotic curve is on the right. He doesn't have any right-sided back pain. But he does have pain right down here at the very bottom of his spine. Overall, his spine's relatively well balanced. So based on his main complaint of left-sided low back pain and left foot weakness, I wondered if maybe his scoliosis wasn't contributing to this, and potentially we could avoid a very large operation. But how can I know for sure? And this is another case where CT-guided transforaminal injections done by our neuro neuroradiologists were extremely helpful. We ordered left-sided L4-5 and L5-S1 CT-guided epidural steroid injections, and therapeutically, his pain was relieved 100%, and actually his foot got stronger, but it only lasted for one month. This is, again, a diagnostic su success, I thought. And in this case, I was able to treat him. I left the scoliosis alone and just treated those two levels at the bottom of his spine. Again, minimally invasively, so same two 1.5-inch incisions. After surgery, his foot was stronger and his pain was relieved. He went home four days after surgery. And our last case is a 74-year-old female. She's otherwise healthy, and she has 50% right-sided leg pain and 50% low back pain, which is worse with standing, improves with laying flat. And this is what her MRI looks like. So three levels where there's stenosis. There's actually a little bit of instability here, you can see. And at these levels, quite a bit of pressure around those nerves, so really no, no room for those nerves at those levels. Again, looking at her x-rays, minimal scoliosis but she does have the, this stepwise areas of instability down at the very bottom of the spine that were certainly contributing to her back pain. And it turns out, if you correct for um, how she's compensating in these x-rays, she actually is 
her head is centered quite a bit in front of her in front of her tailbone, and so she does have a spinal deformity that I believe was contributing to her pain. So in this case, the patient's leg pain localized to the lower levels of the spine where she has instability as well as neural compression, but she also had a problem with global spinal balance. This, there is newer technology that I use where I can fix this global spinal problem just by treating this minimally invasively at the bottom levels, but it's hard to say if this, if this will be enough or if she would still have pain after doing a smaller surgery. And again, she went for CT guided at transforaminal epidural steroid injections and facet injections um, at L2, 3, 3, 4, and 4, 5. So those levels where there's instability and stenosis at the bottom. And she had only a couple of days of very, very good resolution of pain. And again, this is a diagnostic success. And so I felt confident that just by treating those three levels at the very bottom of her spine minimally invasively that I could help both with her spinal deformity as well as decrease the pressure around her nerves. And in this case, I felt it was a very good radiographic result. So some final thoughts about this. Again, the goal of modern spine surgery is to individualize treatment to each patient to devise the most minimally invasive surgery that you possibly can, but still have high likelihood of success in making a patient feel better. And the evaluation begins with a thorough history and physical. It continues with MRI, CT, and x-rays. And I would argue that a critical component of both therapeutics and diagnostics of these problems are uh, very, very precise mechanisms of determining uh, where the pain is coming from, including CT-guided transforaminal epidural steroid injections. And I think Dr. Shaw is absolutely right. This requires a very, very close working relationship with our uh, friends in neuroradiology, and I think we have a great setup for that here. So I'd like to thank um, everybody that helped with this. Uh, good evening. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to share some of what UCSF radiology and biomedical imaging is doing with advanced imaging to help diagnose and treat patients with spinal disease. And um, thank you, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Clark, for really showing us how important the role of um, spine injections can be in taking care of these patients. So we saw some of the pain generators um, that were described that can result in disability uh, related to abnormality within the spine. And you can see here some of the structures that were uh, mentioned. Uh, we have normal spine seen from the side here with the vertebral body and the discs cushioning, the joints in the back that create some of the space, the neuroforamen for the nerves to exit, and we have that contrasted with the abnormal level here at L5 um, and the sacrum. You can see a cadaveric specimen here with the open spinal canal, and that's where the nerves traverse. Here are the facet joints that we have seen previously, and here is marrow and uh, veins that are interspersed between the normal blood spaces. So here's a nice diagram showing an open canal. We see how herniation of disc material can compress on the traversing roots, and how when the facets become inflamed, they can also have bony overgrowth that compresses the nerves that are normally in the canal there. So I thought we'd look at some of these very common spine injections that we do and that you may have heard of um, and go over um, what we inject, how we inject, and where. And these include nerve and epidural injections, facet blocks, ablation where we heat up or burn the nerves that can um, innervate some of these facet joints, and also injections into areas of pain that we may not think could be related to the spine. So where are we injecting? Um, this is a nice diagram that shows the spinal canal. You can see the spinal cord here and the nerves exiting out those spaces that we have seen, the foramina. And do you see this covering over the delicate nervous structures? Here's a magnified view on the inset. And there's this covering called the dura, dura mater, or tough mother. And so, 
you can see how that protects all these delicate structures. And outside of that covering is the epidural space. So that's all outside the dura. And so in this space is fat and some vessels. And you can see it's like a moat surrounding a castle. And that's a very nice space to access and put medication in. See how it's close to those structures that can be pain generators. Here's your facet joint. Looks like a little hamburger on either side. Here's the disc. And here are the nerves. So this is a great space to access to try to put in medications to help improve the pain. And why do we have this pain? Um, it might make sense that maybe something compresses the nerve and you should have pain, but not every nerve that's compressed is painful. When these structures in the spine are um, injured or if they have tears, as we see here, this is the annulus that surrounds the more cushiony part of the disc that's hydrated that you saw in the um, prior images. And if we get little tears, as we do with just normal um, maturation, that cushiony part can actually herniate through. Um, and you can see how close it, to, it is to nerve structure. You can see how the facets are very close, and those can become inflamed as well. And they set up and release these inflammatory proteins, and some are listed here. And when that inflammatory cascade gets set up, that's when it's painful for us. So it makes sense that we would want to inject something to help with the pain. And a radiologist was one of the first ones to do that back in the early 1900s. So what do you think he decided to inject into that space? Saline or salt water, basically, cocaine, steroids, or lidocaine? Cocaine. And so fortunately today, we are using much more reasonable substances to treat pain. So we inject anesthetics, steroid, and a little bit of dye or contrast to help us see where the injection and the medication is going. So when there's injury, um, the nerves get excited and they start sending out impulses. So whether it's um, toxic, whether it's compression, whether it's thermal um, injury, and it sends a signal down the nerve to where it connects to or synapses to nerves in the spinal cord, and then it continues up into the brain, and you perceive that as pain. So when we administer anesthetics, it disrupts that impulse temporarily, and you can feel relief, and that probably plays into some of the relief that the patients that Dr. Clark talked about immediately felt. That's a much more um, fast-acting um, effect. And then the steroids that we inject have slightly more multiple um, mechanisms of action. First, it's anti-inflammatory. So it can negate some of that um, inflammation that those proteins are inducing. Um, it also acts on the nerve membrane, so you know where it's irritated, it's really shooting off. It helps to stabilize that, and then it acts back on the spinal cord so that you aren't going to perceive pain as you normally would. So it has a couple more things going on, and it may take a little longer if there is going to be a steroid effect, and many times it may be a couple of weeks. So for those patients that don't really have a steroid effect, it may be that just as Dr. Clark mentioned, it may be just days or a couple of weeks of relief. But any time after that, it may be attributable to this effect of the steroid. And what I can tell you that is not an effect of the steroid is you will not, from our steroids, be a professional athlete. So that's a whole different category of steroids. Um, but what you might feel from the steroids is very energetic. You might want to stay up and clean the house or build a house. You may feel very moody. Um, and we like to tell people that because those loved ones around them are going to really wonder what's going on. Um, and those patients who have diabetes, their sugars can go up a little bit. Uh, patients with high blood pressure, their blood pressure can go up a little bit. So these are some mild things that you might experience from the steroids that we inject. We know these work, um, not just from the examples that um, Dr. Clark and Dr. Shaw mentioned, but we know from large patient studies that these injections are capable of really helping you with your pain. And for those patients that aren't able to have surgery, they can be a very useful resource for having you comfortable and managing uh, your normal um, activities of life. 
So how do we do these? Um, sometimes we meet patients who say that, well, I've had these done just in the office and they never used anything to show us where the needle would go. And, and that can be a way to do some injections, but clearly if there's image guidance, it will have a more precise and accurate placement of the needle and the injection. Um, so most people having these injections will probably have them under regular x-ray. And that's an example here. Um, what you can see with regular x-ray is bone. So you really can't see nerve directly. You can see it indirectly by knowing where the nerve might be. So here's a diagram that shows the vertebral body. Here's a bridge off of that body called the pedicle, and the nerve always travels underneath that. Here's a little disc that's causing a kink in the um, nerve that's traversing below. So here we can see in this x-ray, here's the pedicle I was talking about. So since we expect that the nerve should be right under the pedicle, with x-ray we can place the needle there and we can put a little dye and that nicely outlines the course of this nerve. So we're seeing it indirectly that way. So many times patients will have injections that can be very effective and they're done by placing it where we think the nerve should be under that pedicle. We like to use CT here. Um, we get asked to help out um, with a lot of patients who might have complicated anatomy, as you saw before. Um, it lets us have much greater detail. And you can see here not just the bone in the vertebral body. Here's the facets. Here's the nerve, so we can actually see it. Um, and here's the needle that goes to the nerve, not into it, just up to it. And here's the dye and the contrast that nicely outlines it. And so this clearly allows us to place the needle more accurately and more precisely. And it's not a surprise that studies confirm that injections done with image guidance, and particularly CT and MR image guidance, are more accurate and precise. So remember we saw the epidural space? Well, we can get there in a couple of ways. So here is the needle. It's at the foramen where the nerve is. And you can see how, with the dye, our injection will get into that epidural space. So it's a nice demonstration of what we call the transforaminal epidural because we're getting there through the foramen. Okay. <laughs> you can also get there by going down the middle. So here's that epidural space. Here a patient has pretty advanced facet disease and back pain. So if you have predominant back pain, this is a nice place to go to coat the area. If you have leg pain, you want to definitely get the nerve that's in the foramen. Those patients who have both often can be injected in both places. This is another example of why CT is helpful. These are patients who were not able to get their injections done under regular x-ray. And that's because they've had surgery, and you can see that they've removed, actually, some of the bone that serves as landmarks sometimes for injections under regular x-ray. You can also see that the bones are fused now. So we have no real way to get to that nerve within the foramen, the usual pathway. So we can see with CT exactly where that spinal canal is, where the nerves are, so we can avoid it. And we can come in and skirt along that spinal canal and get right to where the nerve lives in the foramen. So many times post-operative patients have complicated anatomy that will not necessarily allow them to have the injections done under regular x-ray. Here's another patient who, a colleague who normally does injections under regular x-ray, asked for our help. And you can see that the spine is really curved, so there's a significant scoliosis. As a result of that, there's a big traction bony spur here, and that is occluding the usual pathway to get to the nerve in its foramen. Under CT, we can see a safe way to get to that epidural space and the nerve right in its foramen. So again, spinal deformity, um, post-operative um, anatomy can all be very complicated and preclude the usual um, pathways that one might expect to get to under regular x-ray. And CT is definitely helpful in these patients. Here's a patient in uh, neck pain and arm pain, and you can see the MR shows the spinal cord. And here's this huge bony spur and disc that is impinging on the nerve. So for cervical injections, we definitely would recommend having them done under CT guidance. And why is that? 
in addition to the nerves and the spinal cord in the area, you have all these important vessels that supply the brain. You want to avoid doing any sort of injury or injection into those arteries. So here in the CT, you can see that the patient's on their back. Here's their airway. Here's the vertebral body. Here's the spinal canal and the cord. And those red circles are where those vertebral arteries are placed. So they're small. And do you see where our needle is? It is around the nerve. And where is that nerve? Within millimeters of those vertebral arteries. So you want to be able to ensure the patient, yourself, that your needle is in the correct place and there, there is no chance that you will be injuring those delicate vessels. So here's the contrast around the nerve root. You can see it nicely coating the nerve and the needle nowhere near that vertebral artery. And prevention of any sort of um, complication like stroke. So what about CT guidance? Are you worried about exposure? A CT definitely can have that potential, but at UCSF, um, the radiology and biomedical imaging department is at the forefront of reducing exposure to patients. We're a part of a consortium of the whole UC system, and we've pioneered bringing radi radiation exposure to patients down to an all-time low. We've incorporated those practices into our spinal injections. Um, without sacrificing um, the quality of the imaging or the benefit of the injection. This is a patient who came in 2009 and received um, benefit from a facet and nerve block, and, it did, and she did well for about a year, and pain returned, and she came back for a repeat. And here are the images during the part of marking, during the placing of the needles, during injection. And in that time span, we change the parameters of imaging to reduce the dose of more than 90% without sacrificing quality of imaging or the benefit of the injection. And so we continue to push the envelope, lowering dose so that it would be comparable or even less than normal x-ray guidance. So what do we do with these injections? We can treat entities that you've heard about earlier. Um, here's a patient with a huge, huge disc. And unlike the patient that was able to undergo the minimally invasive surgery, she was not able to take off time, even though I know now it can be very short, but she wasn't able to take time out for her surgery. So she asked for help to be more comfortable during that time, waiting for the disc to resorb. And so here you can see a huge disc that's crowding the spinal canal. Here's her injection. And she was comfortable after that. And two months later, there was near complete resolution. Not necessarily related to the injection per se. This might be part of the natural history. But she was certainly more comfortable than she was without the injection. So disc herniations can be um, at least uh, a helpful um, entity to treat with injections for patients who are not able to undergo surgery. Now, what about facet pain? We've heard uh, about this. Um, it can be underdiagnosed because oftentimes we as radiologists don't even think about commenting upon them. Now that we know that they are significant pain generators, we'd make it a point to look there and to try to obtain history that seems to corroborate that this is where the pain is coming from. Unlike patients with disc herniations where they don't like to sit very much, Patients who have this facet type pain often don't mind sitting. So this patient could sit at his stationary bike for hours, but you asked him to walk a couple of blocks, and it's excruciating for him. So we can see the bony overgrowth in these joints. You can see how with this small space, the needle can be guided into it with CT guidance. And he did great for months after the injection. So what would make us think about it? Well, besides the fact that sitting is better for these patients. You can see the distribution of the facet pain. Not only is it in the back and the buttock, but it can go down the back of the leg. It never usually goes to the feet, though. Patients often can say that they feel a catching or locking you know, with changes in position as well. Um, so uh, articles have confirmed the utility and the benefit of these types of rejections, uh, injections. And you can see in this New England Journal article that patients who had the injections compared to patients who did not have the medications placed actually had marked improvement in their back pain. Now, what about patients who have improvement, but it doesn't last very long? We can heat up those little nerves that supply the facets. 
And it may take maybe four months, six months, maybe a year or longer for those little nerves to grow back. And in that time frame, the patient may be more comfortable and may be able to remain independent and do the activities that he or she likes. This is a nice 3D model that shows uh, the placement of these ablation type needles that supply those facet joints. They have a centimeter that's uninsulated and so uh, the um, electromagnetic wave then heats it up to 80 degrees Celsius, so that's really hot, 170 degrees or so, for about 90 seconds. Um, and then we can put a little anesthetic and a little steroid to help with that post-procedural inflammation. Um, this is a little video that might show you how we test to make sure that we're doing the right nerves. And you can see the contractions of the, ner of the nerves with the muscles in the back. And as long as we don't see any of that down the leg, we know we're in a good position to heat it up to that 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, studies confirm the benefit of this type of um, procedure, uh, showing that the median time for those patients who actually had the ablation, 263 days compared to eight days for those patients who did not have uh, the actual um, ablation. What else can we ablate? Um, we can ablate um, tissue that is tumoral. So here's a patient who has a huge destructive lesion in the vertebral body. We can place a probe and, again, burn that tissue and then fill the defect with cement to help stabilize that area of destroyed bone. And now I think we'll um, show a couple of examples of places where we may not think um, pain might emanate from the spine, but might make you think about it, especially if you've been treated um, or diagnosed with other things and the pain hasn't gotten better. And these patients usually will complain of headache or the fact that they can't sit due to uh, structures in these areas. So here's an MR. and. What may strike you is that there's a huge cyst, and that is in the sacrum, and it originates from the sacral nerve roots. This is a Tarloff cyst, maybe some of you have heard of it, named after the neurosurgeon Isidore Tarloff, who found these incidentally when he was um, uh, with cadavers doing a study on the spinal cord. Now, how do we get them? We get them because at the junction of the nerve with the sheath, there's a little opening, and then fluid that normally is in the canal surrounding the other nerve roots starts to insinuate into that sheath. And over time, since it can't come out, it just starts to enlarge. And in some patients, not all, that might put some traction on the nerve, which you can see here traversing the cyst, and could cause symptoms. Why do we get it? Maybe it's congenital. We've seen it in patients who've had some trauma um, or an infection or inflammation. So we can see here in an interop view how these big these cysts can get, how they actually can remodel bone. So you can imagine the tension or traction they can put on the nerve. And um, in this institution, they can be treated. Maybe 50% of the time, uh, the patients might have some sustained relief. Other times, we get asked to help out with injections. So here we are doing a nerve block on a patient who has a Tarloff cyst in his sacral roots. We sometimes get asked to try to aspirate or take some of that fluid out. So here we're looking at a patient on the front to back. Here's some dye that's been put into the sac that surrounds the nerves. Those are the nerves. And here's that cyst. And you can see that it does not communicate um, openly with the rest of the fluid. So that's a cyst where we can put a needle in and take some fluid out to see if that can help with the pain. So both to diagnose and to treat. You can also inject fibrin glue. So in this um, particular patient with a large Tarloff cyst, two needles are placed, one to aspirate and then one to inject the fibrin glue to help seal off that opening. So multiple options for patients who may have cysts that are symptomatic. What about piriformis syndrome, if you've heard of that? Um, here is that piriformis muscle, and you can see the sciatic nerve leaves the pelvis through this group of muscles. So maybe some patients have a muscle that's bigger on one side, maybe it's contracting, maybe it's fibrotic, maybe it's pushing the nerve up against an unyielding structure like the bone that you can feel when you're sitting. So for whatever reason, 
there is something in this area that might cause sciatica. And what we've been doing is looking at nerves and imaging nerves with MRI, really dedicated to trying to understand if there's something abnormal in the nerve. So we're looking at the feet up here, and this is the hip. And you can see the arrow pointing to the sciatic nerve. And on the left side, it is bigger and brighter than on the right. This is looking straight at the patient. Here's the sacrum. Here's the uterus. Here's the piriformis muscle. And there's the nerve coming out under it. And it's bigger and brighter on the left compared to the right. So this type of imaging dedicated to the nerve, trying to see if there's something going on in this region, really helps us to identify some patients who may have this type of extraspinal sciatica. And then we get asked to help to try to confirm that by injecting the nerve, and here it is right next to the unyielding bone underneath the piriformis, or we can inject into the piriformis muscle itself, and we can do anesthetic or steroid or sometimes Botox to help stop the muscle from contracting. Here an interop view shows a fiber span that sometimes is described um, contributing to the compression of that sciatic nerve in the patients with this syndrome. Here's an MR that shows the piriformis muscle. It's pretty symmetric here. After injection of Botox into that piriformis muscle, you can see that it gets smaller, and there's relief from compression against the sciatic nerve. Last uh, examples are for headache. Many people get treated for headache. They think it's migraineous or tension headache. But if it persists, think about facets, because they can refer up to the base of the brain and forward. And so these types of headaches may be related to facet um, disease in the cervical spine, especially if there's a history of any trauma, whiplash, that can injure these uh, facet joints. Here is a patient who had severe pain on the right. And you can see here the CT shows nicely the joint that is abnormal on the right. You can see all that bony overgrowth that narrows the space where the C2 nerve is traversing. Here is the needle that can safely then go to that very small space. Here's the vertebral artery, which it avoids, and so provide sustained immediate relief with the injection at this site. And so just in summary, and I hope these examples have shown how spine intervention can be both diagnostic and therapeutic, and how with advanced imaging that allows for precise placement of the needles and the injection that this can be a safe way to manage non-operatively for those patients who do not, um, are not surgical candidates. For those who are, it allows us to localize for the surgeon where the pain generators are. And our mission is to continue to advance our imaging um, sequences and modalities so that we can more specifically find our pen generators and allow you to have lives that are more comfortable. Um, and so I want to thank you for your attention. And in this room is all the components that make what we do possible from our chairman to allows us to research and to um, our colleagues who allow us to have the privilege to participate in your care, and then mostly um, to you uh, for your trust in us uh, to be able to work with you to um, advance what we know to make your lives better. So uh, with that, I just want to thank everybody for their attention, and I think we're going to um, maybe spend a couple of minutes going over what uh, the future holds, and Dr. Shaw will uh, go ahead and present that. In these last few minutes before, before we open up the floor to questions, I am going to talk about some research opportunities um, and, and important opportunities to advance the field of spine imaging and intervention um, that is going on here at UCSF. So as Dr. Chin mentioned, at UCSF, um, our radiologists are not just involved in taking care of patients, but we also play an important role in training the next generation of radiologists and physicians, and also play an important role in planning and performing innovative, cutting-edge research that is going to help patients in the future. 
Some of the research opportunities uh, that are currently ongoing at UCSF, particularly as they pertain to spine imaging and spine intervention, include studying imaging biomarkers for spinal pain. So as both Dr. Clark and Chin mentioned, sometimes it is just not clear as to what is actually causing the patient's pain. The patient may have obtained a CT scan, an MRI, um, and there might be many potential pain generators, but sometimes we need more advanced imaging or other tools to help identify that precise pain generator. And this is really um, particularly relevant for both disc-related pain and facet joint-mediated pain. Uh, there can be overlapping pain syndromes uh, in the spine, and, and being able to precisely diagnose what the pain generator is will help both our referring colleagues or neurosurgeons, um, as well as radiologists and other colleagues that are treating these patients with interventional procedures. There is also an emphasis on performing outcomes-based research. So um, there are currently a lot of different algorithms um, and treatment plans that are used for patients with spine-related pain, and these are costly. And so a lot of effort is being spent, uh, not only here at UCSF, but also nationwide, looking um, at studies uh, or doing studies which are looking at the outcomes of the different treatment plans. And finally, a very exciting area is the use of image guidance to deliver precise molecular-based therapies in patients with chronic pain. So I'll touch upon a couple of these. So the first, uh, looking at imaging biomarkers of disc disease. So we've talked about how degenerative disc disease is a leading cause of pain and disability in adults in the United States. There are two stages of disc degeneration. The early stage, which consists of biochemical changes, and this leads to a later stage, which consists of some of the morphologic changes that we can see on a CT scan and MRI. And while we can diagnose these morphologic changes that occur later, what we really want to do is identify these biochemical changes that are occurring much earlier, okay? And because if we can identify those changes of disc degeneration or disc disease earlier, then we can act upon them sooner. Researchers at UCSF in our radiology department are studying novel imaging methods to detect these early changes in the discs using advanced imaging modalities such as PET scans and PET MRIs. It would also be very helpful to identify an imaging biomarker of facet pain. As Dr. Chin showed, facet pain can lead to back pain. That can also be referred down into the buttocks or back of the legs. Sometimes in, in older patients who may have disc disease, facet arthritis, and spinal stenosis, it's not clear as to what's causing the pain. So we have researchers here are using um, advanced imaging modalities such as PET MRI to also help identify biomarkers of facet pain. And here is an example from a recent study that was done here by one of my colleagues. So we are using a specific radiopharmaceutical, a specific tracer called sodium fluoride. This is a tracer that accumulates in areas of increased bone perfusion, such as facet joints that are inflamed and that are constantly turning over bone and where bone remodeling is taking place at an active rate. And here is an example of a patient that on a CT scan had multiple areas of facet arthritis, but had left-sided pain, and, and lo and behold, using this PET MRI, we were able to pick up the area of uptake in the facet joint that was symptomatic, and had a, this patient had a very nice responsive to a facet injection and a radiofrequency ablation that Dr. Chin showed. So there is some promise being shown in some of the early research that is coming out of this department in identifying specific pain generators for patients with spine-related pain. I also want to talk about some of the novel treatments that are being developed for treating chronic pain. This is another example of a study done here um, at UCSF a couple of years ago, and work in this area is ongoing. For those of you that have chronic pain or, or know others that have chronic severe pain, you know that it can be agonizing, and methods to control it are often inadequate or limited by side effects. In this study, 
researchers at UCSF used a CT scanner to guide needles through the skin of pigs directly to pain transmitting nerve fibers. Through these needles, they injected a very powerful neurotoxin, which is actually a variant of capsaicin, which is the spicy ingredient in chili peppers. And this drug is toxic to pain transmitting neurons. This study enabled the authors, this technique of in, this injection enabled the authors to selectively block pain transmission in pigs without affecting the other bystander nerves that carry other sensory information. So what are some of the next steps in imaging research? Well, additional work is needed, particularly longitudinal and prospective studies to study the role of these, some of these early promising biochemical uh, or imaging biomarkers that have been shown to correlate with conventional measures of disc and facet disease. We also need further studies in assessing the role of novel pain agents in treating chronic pain. At UCSF, our research is a team effort and it's a collaborative effort between clinicians, between, uh, a re between PhDs. Uh, here is an example of a, um, our musculoskeletal and quantitative imaging research group that led by Dr. Sharmila Majumdar. And um, her group has led a lot of the early work in uh, looking at imaging biomarkers of disc disease and facet pain. Finally, I'd like to end with this slide. I hope we've conveyed to you in this, in this session that we as spine radiologists really play a central role in coordinating care for patients with spine-related pain. We work very closely with the spine surgeons, the neurologists, the internists, the pain management specialists, so that we can help you with your pain. In addition to being experts in image interpretation and performing image-guided intervention, we are also, as I showed, leading innovative research efforts to help the next generation of patients. I hope you found the session useful. I am now going to open up the session for questions that any of the speakers can answer. Thank you so much for your attention. So um, we uh, do the injections um, at all of our sites, um, Mission Bay, uh, predominantly at China Basin and also at our Parnassus campus. So for outpatients, um, that is the majority of um, the patients that we see, that is at our China Basin Outpatient Precision Spine and Peripheral Nerve Center. Um, for patients who are in the hospital and patients who require, uh, say, deeper anesthesia or who have medical conditions that require closer surveillance, then we can do these at the hospitals at Parnassus um, and at um, Mission Bay. Uh, so I think then the question of where we do these procedures and um, are you also asking how uh, the referral system is established? Um, that's true. We're happy to work with your, um, your internist, uh, but we also, as you saw here, work so closely with um, our um, surgical colleagues, um, our neurologist, um, oncologist, uh, rehab um, doctors as well, so that we are happy to also refer that you see them, and in that way, if they find that that is um, a reasonable approach to have the injection, then we work with them to have you come see us through them. So the, the question was that in our image-guided interventions, uh, we are putting needles in close proximity to the nerves uh, in the epidural space, um, and what is the risk of damaging these structures? So thank you for that question. Um, I would say that the, the role of image guidance and precision here plays a big role in ensuring that the procedures happen safely. Um, as Dr. Chin and Dr. Clark mentioned, in our section, in our department, we do these pain procedures under image guidance, particularly CT guidance, so that we can precisely see where the needle tip is in proximity to all the vulnerable structures in the spine and around the spinal canal, including the spinal nerve, including the vertebral artery, and, and other uh, nerves and arteries. Um, I would say that we have an extremely uh, 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 
proud record of, uh, of being very safe with our injections. Uh, and uh, although uh, these injections do carry a very small risk of, of nerve damage or bleeding or infection, those risks um, under uh, CT guidance and precise needle placements are exceedingly small. So we have many choices to um, image patients and to try to figure out where their pain is coming from, as we mentioned. Um, some of the structures that are causing pain, such as bony structures and the joint structures, definitely are um, best evaluated with, say, CT. We can see the bony spurs that are growing around the facet joints or the bony spurs that are a result of disc disease. Um, that is something that CT is ideal um, for depicting. Um, if you use regular x-ray, sometimes you only see just um, a fraction of what's going on. You don't see the nerves and how they're being pressed upon by those um, areas of degeneration and um, arthritic changes. And so you really do want to be able to figure out when you see these abnormal structures, how they're affecting the nerve. Um, and that can lead us to make a diagnosis of where a patient's symptoms might be coming from. So with just regular x-ray, you aren't going to have that um, exquisite detail. But why is, why is it better than, say, like an MRI? Oh, so MRI is also um, an option. MRI uh, is best for looking at the soft tissue structures. Um, it's based on um, how water protons are moving around. Um, so in bony structures where there's a lattice that kind of keeps the water from moving as much as, say, in other structures like fluid or nerve, then it's a little harder to identify bony abnormality on MR as it is with CT. So there are different modalities that each have their strengths for looking at the different parts of the spine. The spine has kind of bony structures that house the more delicate nerve structures, and each modality has an advantage for identifying and evaluating each of those parts. Um, I have many colleagues who um, inject with x-ray guidance, and they're very um, uh, talented, and they have um, good outcomes. Um, I think uh, in those cases where we know that the anatomy is definitely um, uh, abnormal or uh, they've had surgery where the anatomy is not going to be in the conventional place or cervical, I think if it were myself or a family member, I might want to have it done under CT guidance. Um, I think there are many people who have these done safely and effectively with x-ray guidance. We happen to have um, the benefit of being able to use the CT um, and can see how it can be very helpful and um, more precise. And so I, I can't say that it wouldn't be um, in your best interest, but I can at least give you the conditions where I know it should be um, probably done under some advanced image guidance. So we have um, both, actually. They're available on the scanner. Um, and for um, some, uh, some of the injectionists, they like to be kind of right there. You take the picture, and it is almost instantaneous. Um, others can move it and take a picture. But again, you don't move the needle until you've seen where it is. So I think um, when you have multiple needles, sometimes it may be helpful to do it a certain way. Um, and when you just have one needle, it may be um, advantageous to do it. But I think each way is safe um, and can be um, time effective. Um, and also, um, it has very low um, radiation exposure. The, the question was that we talked about injecting certain joints, like the facet joints in the spine. Um, but could we inject other, sp other potentially pain-generating joints in the body, including the sternoclavicular joint? And yes, the answer is yes, that we can um, uh, with, with our, Im and again, we would do this using image guidance, uh, we can get uh, needles into very small spaces, including joints such as the sternoclavicular joints, if, if we believe that those are a pain generator for you. The question was, is the location of pain related to where the, the vertebral body is. Um, I, th I think the, the location or where um, 
you might feel the pain might be related to some of the structures that are getting pinched or, or around which there is inflammation. So for example, if you have a disc herniation at the L4, L5 level, and that is contacting the L5 nerve root, and there is inflammation around that nerve root that is generating pain, then you may not necessarily feel pain in, in the back where that disc is, but you might feel pain, what I, what I showed you as radicular pain, or pain radiating along the distribution of that L5 nerve, which is typically along the outside of the leg and can go all the way onto the foot. Uh, now, if the pain is related to inflammation around the facet joints, then that might be more localized to where that particular facet joint is. So the, the question was that I, I showed some examples of hybrid imaging modalities such as PET MRI, and I showed some very nice uh, uh, images. And, and I think the question was, um, if I understand correctly, where in the process after imaging are these fusion, imagings, uh, fusion images being acquired? Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so actually, so you were talking even before we actually get the patient in the scanner and acquire images. Yeah, so there are uh, medical uh, equipment manufacturers such as GE and Siemens and Philips and others that are spending an enormous uh, amount of time and effort and money into developing some of the newer generation of scanners, including these hybrid scanners and these newer sequences that can be very helpful both in, in spine-related care, in oncologic applications, and others. Um, and so we work very closely uh, because we, we are a very large medical center with a lot of uh, imaging equipment and a lot of scanners. We work very closely with these uh, manufacturers and these vendors uh, to help them develop these new scanners and these new sequences. So um, the way that we are protected um, is twofold. Um, so if you are in the room during the actual procedure, then you have protective lead. Um, if you are walking back and forth, taking the image, looking at it, and then going back, then you are not exposed. So the question is, uh, using minimally invasive spinal techniques, how many levels are you capable of decompressing at once, and what are indications for stabilization and instrumentation? Um, I think that's a great question. Um, in my practice, I will minimally invasive decompress uh, up to four levels of the lumbar spine. Um, and even doing four levels really doesn't add any additional pain, and those pa people still go home the same day of surgery. Um, indications for instrumentation and stabilization, you know, certainly if there's spinal instability like I showed, um, that would be an indication for stabilization. Um, sometimes, uh, and this was a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but if there is an actual mechanical compression of the nerve root, in other words, if the disc is degenerated to the point where the bones have literally settled on the nerve and it needs a disc reconstruction to lift the bones off the nerve, that would be an indication for stabilization as well. Are the numbers different for thoracic versus lumbar? Potentially, uh, you know, the thoracic spine is stable. Uh, so the question was, uh, is there a difference between thoracic and lumbar spine? Um, and I think the answer is yes, because within the thoracic spine, there's um, internal stabilization from the rib cage. OK, so we're going to call to an end this session on spine imaging and precision imaging. Um, I would like to thank our chairman, uh, Dr. Dillon, uh, for giving us this opportunity to speak here today. And I'd like to thank my co-presenters, Dr. Aaron Clark and Dr. Cynthia Chin as well. And thank you all for coming out here tonight. Um, I hope this was useful and uh, that you are armed with a lot more information about the spine and spine-related care than when you started about an hour and a half ago. Thank you very much. Thank you.